Top of the time, tea time. Yeah, this is tea time. Yeah, making a difference. One cup at a time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time, time, time. making a difference. One cup at a time. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is tea time with Miss Liz. That's right, Miss Liz is back in the house. And tonight I have an incredible guest. I have Natasha Dean joining me all the way from Canada. That's right, we're back in Canada. So we have two double dippers in Canada, Miss Liz and Natasha Dean. So I'm going to do the little intro and disclaimer and all that good stuff. And then we're going to have some good old sweet tea tonight with Natasha Dean. So before we get started, the disclaimer for Miss Liz's live tea time live studio shows oh where did we go we almost had a blackout there <laughs> miss liz is going live using Streamyard. before leaving leaving a comment please grant Streamyard permission to see your name at streamyard.com please be advised that the content brought forward for any tea time show hosted by myself miss liz is always brought forward in good faith, however, may bring forth dialogue and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the given time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participation are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussion for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that this show is not made for you at this time, I respect that choice. And we'll see you at a later show at a later time. Now, let me get the incredible Natasha Dean in here. And then I'm going to pull up her bio and we're going to do some good old sweet tea talking tonight. And we're going to make a difference with one story at a time. Welcome, Natasha. It is an honor to have you here tonight. Hello, hello, Miss Liz. And hello to our audience. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for spending time with me. Oh, absolutely. It's an honor to have a fellow Canadian here with me. So if you'd like to share a little bit, I'm just going to pull up your bio here. Sure. Uh, because we had a little techno issue or just a little glitch. No worries. So if you'd like to share a little bit, Natasha, about who you are and where you're from and all that good stuff. Sure. So, um, I have kind of an interesting origin story. So I was born in Canada, but when I was three weeks old, we moved back home to Guyana, which is in South America. I grew up there for five years, then moved back to Canada. So born Canadian, but I have an immigrant experience with Canada because it's not the first country I knew. I went through school, um, thought I would be a psychologist, did a hard pivot into writing after university and uh, worked, <laughs> worked, I was gonna say, I worked really hard at getting lots of rejection. Um, I think I am around somewhere in the neighborhood of over 450 rejections uh, to be able to be in this very special place uh, as a writer and spending time with you today. Uh, and so I've been a writer for about 15 years and I write for kids, teens and adults um, in the, you know, the, the realm of writing for kids and teens. I write for kids who are at grade readers, meaning they're in grade three and they read at a grade three level. Uh, and I also write for striving readers, which are kids who are like in grade six, but they're reading at a grade three level. And I write in a variety of genres from uh, mystery and contemporary to science fiction and fantasy. Uh, so that's sort of the grown up stuff that you need to know about me. Uh, the, the real stuff is, I super love animals. Um, I am all about tea. And um, you can probably buy my loyalty with a cupcake or a cookie. Oh, well, look at that. 
Another tea drinker. <laughs> I love these tea drinkers. Because <laughs> a lot of people come on tea drinkers. They're like, Miss Liz, I don't even like tea. I'm like, oh, but you don't know what, what? <laughs> Right? <No>. You're right? <laughs> no, tea. Any problem in the world is going to be solved with a cup of tea. Right? So, so what's your favorite cup of tea? Oh, um, I, I think it would be considered like a Guyanese tea. So it's just like a regular black tea, like a an orange pico tea. And then you steep it for a really long time. So it's very strong. And then you add tons of sugar and uh, like real, like evap milk, like really thick cream. Um, and yes, it's like a warm, sweet, creamy hug. So that is, that is the, that is how I drink my tea. And then when I'm trying to not have quite so much sugar and caffeine in my system, I go Jasmine. <laughs> I, I, I think I, I've been offered that tea. It's like a really sweet kind of dark tea, right? That's really creamy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. We always joke in Guyanese culture that, um, you know how big your problem is because when you go to talk to somebody and you're like, Oh, I, I have this problem and this is what it is. And when they make you the cup of tea, you can tell how bad the problem is by how much sugar they put in. So mm -hmm. the worse the problem, the more sugar they give you. Uh, and I was, I was really delighted because I got to pull that into one of my YA novels in the key of Niragani. So whenever she's going to her grandmother, her grandmother, she can tell by how much sugar her grandmother puts in the tea, um, exactly how much, how much trouble her problems are putting her in. I like that. The sugar describes the level of trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> so you know if there's a lot of sugar, you, you're either in trouble or there's a lot of trouble. At the right. Table. There's, it's like you need the strength, right? You need the energy. So, yeah. Yeah. So, Natasha, I see here in your bio, because you've described a lot that I, I would read to the audience, but I'm going to just read your bio because it is an incredible bio. And then we'll talk about some of the awards that you've won and some of your books and all of that and your message that you'd like to give to the world tonight. Yeah. So your Natasha is award-winning author. Natasha Dean writes for kids, teens, and adults. She believes the world is changed one story at a time. And as a Ga Guianas, I might say Guyanese. Guyanese. Yeah, you're close. You're close. Yeah. Guyanese Canadian whose family immigrated to Canada. She's seen firsthand how stories have the power to shape the world. And I truly believe that as well. Our stories do impact the world. When she was not writing, Natasha enjoys visiting schools, libraries, and other organizations to help people to find and tell the stories that live inside of them. She also spends the in door in order. In order to <laughs> my tongue, tw tongue twister, say that time, five times, right? right. Amount of, <laughs> amount a of lot time of time, to, right? It, it's like one of those words that you want to say, but you can't say, and your tongue is just like, no, you're I, not. I know your brain right. saying it, and your tongue is like, no, <laughs> not happening. <laughs> so I'll get you to say that word an and, inordinate. And, and we're going to talk about that word because I want to know a little bit more about that word. Amount of time trying to convince her pets that she's the boss of the house. I, I'm, I'm the same here. My cat thinks she's the boss. I, I'm, she's a real princess. <laughs> <laughs> and Natasha is the, is the author of the Lark Boss series, the CCBC Best Pick for Kids and Teens Star Selection, and the Guardian series Moonbeam Awards, Sunburst Award nominee, Alberta Reader's Choice nominee, and her la latest novel is The Key of Nira Ga Gianna? Ghani. Ghani. Ghani is yeah. a junior library gu gal guide, guide, go, guide, a guild, guild, guild yeah. selection <laughs> and a Barnes and Noble top 25 most anticipated own voices novel. And I'm truly sorry for all of those little blips and bloopers and all that. No, no, no apologies necessary. So let's talk a little bit about that word that I can't say. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> so what does that word mean and why is it important to you? Oh, inordinate is just, um, I love it because it's a tongue twister word and it's just, it just means a lot of, <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and it's, it's one of those tricksy things because a lot of times as writers, uh, when we're doing workshops or we're presenting at festivals, they'll come and say to us, okay, uh, you need to give us a bio and it can only be 50 words, 25 words, however many words. So a lot of is three words. Inordinate is one word. It means the same thing. So 
it, it chunks in there to say the same thing. And, and I get under the word count that that organization is asking me to do. Well, I just learned something new tonight. Thank you for sharing that <laughs> to the viewers and listeners out there. We all learn something new. <laughs> And we learn a couple of tongue twisters along the way during tea time. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> so let's get into the message that you want to share with the world, that one story makes mm -hmm. a difference and the impact. What have you seen about stories and the impact that it has made through your books? Um, well, it, so it, I'll answer that in, in two ways. So the backstory for why I say that stories change the world um, comes from when my family moved to moved back to Canada um, permanently. And so it was my first winter. I, you know, just landed in Canada um, and was very excited to be here. I thought this was like this amazing new adventure. Uh, and then that winter, the first snowfall um, going to school, there was a group of grade nine boys that uh, we're making snowballs and packing them with stones and hurling at my sister and I, calling us lots of racial slurs, telling us to go back, you know, go back where you come from, go back home. Um, and it was it was really really traumatic. Um, it was violent and it it uh, it was sort of an out of body experience, right? Because it was the first time uh, that I understood that my color made me different and that my color made me a target. And that there were some people who were never going to look at my skin color and understand that that was beautiful. Um, they would look at it and think other things. So what ended up happening was I told my parents and they uh, tracked down the ringleader. And my mom phoned and um, she phoned and she talked to his grandparents because that's who he was living with. And then they ended up coming over, the grandfather and the son came over, or the, the boy came over, sorry. And um, I remember him getting down on his knees and apologizing to us and crying and saying that he hadn't understood exactly what it meant, what he had been doing. Um, and it didn't click in at the time, but you know, looking back, what I realized was it was a story, right? I, I had something happen to me from someone who had an idea or a story of who I was. I went to my parents, I told them the story of what happened. They, you know, my mom went door to door looking for this kid, um, found him, called the grandparents, told the grandparents a story of what was going on. And the grandfather and the grandmother sat down and told the boy a story, right? Told him a story of the boy he was, and the man that he could be based on the decisions that he was making. And then he came to tell us that he understood, right? His story had changed, the narrative changed. And then he started telling us about how, um, you know, that, that what had happened was his parents were divorcing. It was a really terrible, gross divorce. And they had moved him to go live with grandma and grandpa while this was all going on. So he was angry. He was angry and we were a target and he understood the um, the inaccuracies of, of that particular story. You know what I mean? Like he understood that uh, he had taken out something that should have been like an counseling or a therapy. He took it out on us and, and that shift, right? So when I say that stories change the world, that's what I'm talking about. Our experiences, our willingness to talk about the things that make us happy, that make us sad, um, those are the things that create space for other people to reflect on themselves, to reflect on the world, to reflect on who they want to be in the world and the kind of world that they want to live in. Um, and so when I bring that into my writing and into my work, uh, what you're going to see is that my characters may be going through some, some very, very difficult times. So uh, for example, my YA book that just came out, which is The Signs and Wonders of Tuna Rashad, they are dealing with grief. Robbie is her older brother. He's just lost his husband um, and the whole family is grieving. So we're going to deal with really heavy stuff, but there's going to be light. There's going to be love. There's going to be happiness. Uh, one of the great things that I love hearing from readers is how funny they find my books. I really appreciate that because we are talking about difficult things. Um, and that there are some 
there's some kind of positive resolution at the end. It may not be a Hollywood happy ending, but there is going to be some kind of happy ending because I feel the same way in our waking world. When we make the decisions that honor ourselves and that ground us and um, give us strength, there's always going to be happiness at the end of, of that road, at the end of that rainbow. So, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that, Natasha. Like, and I say this all the time, stories do make a difference because they resonate, right? And like mm -hmm. you explained, like this boy was going through a lot and it was easier for him to target somebody else because he didn't understand what he was going through. He was the, the frustrations and that, right? So it's easy to pick on somebody else. And that's what bullying all, all is really down to is they're frustrated with themselves or the situation that they're in. So they pick on other people, right? So mm -hmm. being bullied as a child in school, what do you do about it today? Do you speak on it? Do you share it in your books? Uh, yeah, um, I do a lot of uh, school visits. Um, and uh, we do, like my presentations do, discuss those kinds of things. I, I talk to kids about the things that I went through that are kind of universal, right? We're trying to find our place in the world. We're trying to fit in. We're trying to find friends. We're trying to deal with the bullies. Uh, we're trying to deal with our parents. Um, all, those, all those things. So, yeah, they definitely come in into, into play when I'm doing uh, school presentations. Well, I, I see that you have, like, a... a, a impactful way of bringing it to the table right and this is what mm -hmm. we need is we need that difference and by writing with children's books it actually reaches them at a younger age so that mm -hmm. you know it can impact their lives as older this boy that bullied you in school do you know of him now as an adult or no he was in grade nine and i was in kindergarten so the next oh. year he was he was gone um and uh yeah but you know it, it's interesting because there was that moment where he apologized and we hugged. Uh, and then the next day he was back on the school field in the morning and the afternoon, just as he had been for those weeks before. Um, but this time, instead of, you know, throwing snowballs and racial slurs, he would call out to us, to me and my big sister. And he would always ask us the three same questions every morning and every afternoon. Are you okay? Has anybody hurt you? can I help you? Always those three questions. Um, yeah, so I hope wherever he is and whatever it is he's doing with his life, he has um, all the happiness and, and joy that his heart can hold. Um, but yeah, I mean, when we, when we talk about these kinds of things, I think it's always really important to be transparent and to be candid about the things that we go through, especially with, with young readers and, and young uh, kids like kids and teens because I don't think us holding back is necessarily helpful because the more I feel like the more honest we are and within age appropriate levels right obviously the, the way we're going to talk to a five-year-old is not going to be the way that we talk to a 15 year old and the topics are not going to be necessarily the same um, but when we own I think those hurts we give kids space to own their hurts and to to navigate through and books are a huge part of this, right? Like books, I mean, a lot of us are really, really lucky. We had adults in our lives that we could go to and we could talk to and we could find comfort. But there are a lot of kids, there are no adults in their lives and books become their saving grace. That's why it's so important for us to, like for libraries and schools to have books that represent the full scope of what a childhood experience can be because not everybody is getting tucked in to bed at night and being read a story to, right? There are a lot of kids who are like raising their younger siblings. There are a lot of kids who are hiding in closets um, and they deserve to see those struggles and those realities, their realities uh, represented in an age appropriate and, and honest and loving and respectful way. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that, Natasha. And for the viewers and listeners out there, if you're watching the replay, please push what you're, uh, please share where you're tuning in from because we'd like to hear from you. And if you'd like to really reach out to Natasha, her website is here on the screen during the video, during the audio podcast, check in the description. All of that information is in there as well. So Natasha, I want to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. What age did you write your first book? 
Oh gosh, I think I was 29. Um, I so when I was a kid, uh, I was nine years old, and Miss Liz, I don't know if you're gonna remember or know this author, Gordon Corman. So I'm reading Gordon Corman, This Can't Be Happening in McDonald Hall. I read the author bio and I find out that he wrote this book when he was 13. And I am amazed and astounded. I go to every adult I know because I love books. How did he do this? How did he become a, a writer at 13? How did he become a writer, period? And nobody had the answer. And so uh, I decided at nine that that probably meant that being a writer was sort of like a lottery. You just sort of lucked into it. And uh, and so I, I went into university and I was actually um, studying. I it was in the, the period, right? I was upgrading. Uh, I had a couple of classes left to do so that I could move into doing my master's for psychology. Um, and one of the things that they had you doing was um, not not exactly counseling, but you had to like go in and, and talk to people and those kinds of things. And that's when I realized how much the stories we tell ourselves create the reality we live in. And it hit me about how often we do this. And we've been doing it from the time we were old enough to make words and to dream, right? I love my family. I love my brother. I wish I could sell my brother on eBay, you know, like all those, you know, all those kinds of <laughs> How things. much can I get um, for him? <laughs> right? How much can I get for this kid? <laughs> you know, but all those, all the things that we have as children, our rivalries with our siblings, our frustrations, like, you know, and, and the, the desire, I wish I could play volleyball. I wish I could play the trumpet and then the fears. I'm not good enough, or I am good enough, right? So we tell ourselves all these stories. So at that point in time, I was like, no, psychology is not for me. Um, so I thought, okay, I'm just gonna try to find like a job in the meantime, at least let me figure this out, right? Because you never wanna make these like, you know, knee jerk decisions. And it was just in a conversation with my husband and he said, well, what do you really wanna do? And it was nine year old me that said, well, I really wanna write a book. And he said, well, go, go do it. Let's see what happens. Um, and that was, yeah, I think I was like 28, 29, uh, trying to get it done. And I uh, got my first short story published. It was an adult for an adult audience at 31. And, and then I was like, that's it. Y'all open the door for me. I'm, I'm coming through. I'm coming. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 I got my foot in the door, man. That, that's it. Now I just got to squish the rest of my body through. Uh, and that was that was the start of it. So how long did it take you to write your first book? Oh, the first book <clears throat> um, was about a, well, I was going to say a year, but I think if we sort of like chunked it all down, it was probably two or three years. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And, um, and so for all of my emerging writer friends, it take your time. There's there really isn't a, a rush, you know. Our first books can take a year, three years, five years. It's important to like take your time, learn the craft. For any of you out there who are looking to submit, the number one thing that agents and editors say that is the biggest mistake writers make is they submit their work too soon because it's just not ready yet. Um, so I know the world likes to tell us that we should rush and hustle and all those kinds of things, but we don't need to. Telling a story is a big deal lean into it, breathe into it, you know, take your time. I love that you say that, take your time, because writing a book, some people are writing books within hours and I'm like, how do you, how do you do it? <laughs> like, I, I know it's possible, but how do you do it? Because I'm working on writing books and I am like, oh my God, this is, this is taking time because I don't want to rush it. And I'm glad that yeah. you put it out there for the listeners and viewers out there that are watching and will watch later, you know, take your time. You know, we yeah. don't have to be in such a rush. And if it's your first one, you want it to be good, right? You want it to mm -hmm. really make that impact and say, hey, hello, I'm here. I'm opening that door. Like Natasha, like you said, I'm coming in. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly. <laughs> but no, you're right. I think I think it was Danielle Steele who said that she, uh, what does she do? She said she writes something like 12 to 20 hours in a day. Um, and that's how she can get her books out. And I respect that that's her work ethic. I respect that that's the thing that lights her up. But I tell you what, like, I want to be able to go for lunch with my friends. I want to be able to snuggle with my pets and be able to look at my husband and be like, hey, let's let's just go grab lunch. Let's just, 
you know, let's call work early and go sit on the couch and watch a, you know, BBC mystery. Like let's, let's have, like, for me, I love the balance. I want with, I mean, I love that she can survive on four hours, but I tell you what, man, you do not want to see me on four hours of sleep. I need my eight hours. Like, you know, um, so I, it's really important for, for all of us is to figure out what works best for us and to not compare what works for us to what works for other people or think, well, you know, Danielle Steele is running 20 hours a day. You know, I need to do that. Do, but do you, do you really, or is that just, is it just a nice guy? Because what you really, the essence of what she's saying is she's dedicated and she creates time and space. She makes it for like, for her writing. So maybe that's what we take away. And we look at our schedule and we go, well, I can do 20 hours, but you know what I can do? I can do 10 minutes on my lunch break. And it may not feel like a whole lot, but I tell you what, 10 minutes in a day, you will get a book ready. You really will. Yeah. It, it's a slow process, right? It's taking your mm -hmm. time. And I love that you said that, Natasha, that what's good for others is not good for you. And we have to be able to identify with that and say, you know what? Okay, this person is doing 20 hours. I can't do 20 hours. It's going to stress me out. It's going to make me, and I'm going to give you garbage. I'm going to, and it's yeah. not going to be a good product, you know, where, like yeah. you said, 10 minutes a day. And I tell this to mm -hmm. my kids all the time, write at least 10 minutes a day express yourself mm -hmm. at least 10 minutes a day because 10 minutes does make a difference mm -hmm. and short stories make a difference. You know, yeah. it doesn't always have to be a big book. It could be a little, a little blog, a little mm -hmm. article. You're making the impact by sharing your stories and that. So now I think it's a good time to ask you, Natasha, what is your mm -hmm. tea? Oh, uh, my tea. Okay. T for thrills. E for effort. A for accommodation. Now, do you want to explain a little bit why you picked those words? Yeah. So thrills to me is what lights me up, what makes me happy, uh, what gives me fireworks. And I'm, I'm going to do that. Um, and the interesting thing is that that's not always doing the thing that we traditionally feel is like, oh, that's a really exciting, awesome, like, yeah, why wouldn't that make you happy? Right. So Sleeping in, yeah, absolutely. That makes us all happy. Spending the day in our PJs, why not? But sometimes the thing that thrills me is being in a, a moment where the writing is really, really tough and it's not going well. And I make that decision that I'm going to sit here for like the next 15 minutes and I'm just going to give it my best effort. And that thrills me because I love the fact that I'm saying to myself, listen, Let's acknowledge that this is rough. Let's acknowledge that this is boring and hard and it's a grind. But let's celebrate the fact that we are going to push through it, right? We're going to push through it in a way that is loving and accommodating. Um, and we're going we're gonna to get this thing done, right? It's like the satisfaction of meeting the challenge, the satisfaction of meeting that chore and saying, I'm going to come out at the end of this. So that's the T. The E is the effort. Like I said, I, you know, I think sometimes, so my, my writer friends will know this, right? There's NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month. And that's where you challenge yourself to write a novel in a month, 50,000 words. And that means you're writing about 1,667 words per day. And so that's, that's amazing. And that's, it's a really fun challenge and it absolutely makes you pull your hair out. But at the same time, if we internalize that and say, well, I'm not a writer unless I'm writing 1500 words a day or 2000 words a day, that can become um, like, I just think that sometimes that's a really unkind thing to do for ourselves. So the E in effort, what that means is I am just going to try my best and I'm not going to put a product or an end result on what it means to try my best. So some days I'm going to try my best. And at the end of that day, I'm going to have a paragraph. And then some days I'm going to try my best. I'm going to have three pages. One is not better than the other. Both are equal because the only thing I said to myself as I sat down is give it your best faith effort. And if I can do that, then I'm always a success. So the goals, the success, that, that thrill becomes intrinsic. It becomes something that we are in control of. So that's why E is for effort and A is accommodation. So being flexible, understanding that 
you know, not every day are we going to get up and feel like, yeah, I want to conquer the world or, you know, some days we get up and we're not feeling great emotionally, physically, what have you, we haven't slept well, you know, and we need to be able to be kind to ourselves and accommodate those things. You know, if we haven't had a great night, then, you know, maybe the kindest thing to do for ourselves is to skip the gym. But sometimes maybe the kindest thing to do for ourselves is to go into the gym, right? Only we know the best yeah. way to accommodate what we need in that moment. Um, but again, I always try to, to keep flexible with myself in terms of my goals, what I'm asking for myself in the day, what I'm considering a success in the day. And I feel like if I'm always flexible, I'm always putting myself in a position where I'm going to win at the end of the day. I can crawl into bed and be like, yep, that day was a good day. That was a successful day. I like that you you you, you give yourself an A, account, accountability, you know, because before the shows, we, start, we started talking a bit and breaking the ice a little bit because that's what I do with mm -hmm. the guests. And before we go live, we break that ice and we kind of get to know each other. And you talked about self-care and effort and flexible being flexible. So your tea actually makes sense on how important self-care is to you because mm -hmm. the thrill is within you. What thrills your soul, what thrills you, right? And the effort mm -hmm. that you're making each and every day. And you and you say, you know what? Okay, this accommodation is not good for me today. I'm not gonna do the gym. I'm gonna yeah. do it tomorrow. So we need to really bring back the self-care of ourselves. And start yeah. really taking care of ourselves. And I think that's what you do, Natasha, with your writing and with, you, with your speaking and presentations and that as well. So let's get into some of your books. How many books mm -hmm. do you have out there? Oh, uh, I think if we counted uh, adults and teens and kids, I'm probably edging up around the, somewhere between 30 and 40 or 35 and 40. And then if we included uh, short stories, plays, then I'm definitely over 40, 40 works for kids, teens, and adults. Oh, my goodness. Look at you. You really came through that door, did you not? <laughs> I, know, I, did. I told yeah. you I was coming in. <laughs> flexibility. Flexibility makes you good. You can, you can squish through all those tight spots, right? Yeah. You're in that audience where you're like, you know, oh, yeah. I, I yeah. want front stage. Like, so liquid what was lottery your, man you're right it's a lottery you won the lottery you're in that door <laughs> with 30 40 bucks it is incredible uh so where can people find your books natasha oh um on amazon uh indigo if they're canadian barnes and noble at their favorite bookstore um in their libraries i'm i'm in like target walmart you can you can find me Oh, you're all over the place. That's good. So, and if anybody wanted a sign book by you, how could they reach through your website? Yeah, if they emailed me, I have book plates, so I can always I can always mail them out. Yeah. Okay, now let's get into some of these awards. You've won some really incredible awards, and I, I some of these awards I've never heard of. So, if you'd like to share a little bit on these awards, sure. So, let's get into the CCBC Best Pick. Yeah, so that stands for the Canadian Children's Book Centre. And so what they do is they take the new releases and they look at them and they decide which are the books that they're going to recommend as these are the books that you should be reading. These are the books you should add to your library. Um, and I've been really, really uh, lucky. I've had quite a few of my books listed on their on their list. And um, I've had a few that are starred, so they were like, that read, and then these ones you definitely want to read. Um, so that's, that's awesome. Uh, the Alberta Reader's Choice Award is exactly that. It's the, the readers who are deciding. Uh, and I, I love that. Um, you know, and um, what are some other words? Uh, so In the Cave of won the 2020 Amy Mathers uh, Teen Book Award. So that's a national award for Canada. And so she, Nira was like, that's, that's the book for the year. Uh, and that was, that was really great. Um, because that's like, it's, it's always lovely when people appreciate your work. Right. And, and my books have been on the forest of reading, which is the Ontario library association. And Nira was a, um, an honor book, which means that she didn't win the top prize, but she was in the top three. 
And that again, I mean, it's, it's amazing because those are, those are like your actual readers. Those are your teen readers who are deciding, you know, for you. Um, and yeah, I think anytime, you know, we, I was going to say like the, the awards are really amazing. Like all of us, right. We love, we love to get that. Like, okay, good. <laughs> it, it's good. I did. <laughs> for real, for real. You know, um, but for any of my friends who are out there who are looking at publishing, whether it's traditional or self-publishing. So years ago, uh, I had a book that I was trying to get published called True Grime, and it was an urban fantasy. And I got a really, like, I got great feedback from editors and agents. But the the main, like, I was getting turned down because they were like, I love this book. I just don't know how I would sell it. I love this book. I'm just not sure if it's like middle grade or YA. And, you know, and well, we can talk about this in a minute, but like when you write for kids, writing for kids is not remotely like writing for adults. There are some real guidelines. And so I was like, okay, but I had had enough feedback that I was like, I think I'm just going to give this a shot. Like, I think I'm just going to like self-publish this. And this was at a time when self-publishing was very new. So it did not go over well with my writing colleagues who were like, why can't you be patient? Why can't you wait? You know, and I was submitting like, too soon. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I was like, no, this is it. The only reason is people don't know where it would go on a bookshelf. That to me, like it, there was nothing like you're, there's something wrong with the content or your characters don't make sense. It was just like, we don't know how to market this. Well, that's okay. I want to, I want to dive in. I want to experiment. I want to give this a shot. Lots of people were like, no, it's never, you're, it's never going to work. You're, you're going to regret this. No one's going to take you seriously. You're never going to get an editor. You're never going to get an editor. I did it anyway, because it felt right to me. And um, she ended up, True Grime ended up being a top 100 on uh, an award thing, which was cool. But the reason I bring up the story was because I had a friend who was working at a bookstore and she had a lady who came in and the lady was a social worker. And so they had put a child in care and it was terrible what, what the situation this child had been pulled out of. And so the child was with the foster parents is not particularly doing well, is having a really hard time. And so the foster parents are like giving this kid books and the kid is like, I don't want this, I don't want this because the kid doesn't want to read about happy families. They don't have happy families. None of these books are reflecting their experience. So my friend says, well, listen, try this book. It's true grime. There's, there's no like families in it, but there is a family unit. There's a family of friends. And, you know, here, here are the things, you know, that are going on because basically it's like the, the fight between magic and non-magic because magic is like, we're tired of humanity. <laughs> they destroy everything. We need to get rid of them. And what happens, right? <clears throat> so the social worker brings the books, the book, uh, seven days later, she's back in store and she says, does this author have more books because the kid loved it and she wants, she wants more books like this. Wow. And so awards are amazing, but sometimes that book reaching the right, the right reader at the right time, whether or not True Grime ever got on that top 100, you know what? It hit a kid right when they needed it. And that makes it worth all all of it right that is every award we ever need because that's what we're trying to do with our work we're trying to connect to readers um and just quickly to get back to that idea of the guidelines so people think writing for kids is like oh i'm just gonna tell a kid a story no <laughs> there's there's no such thing right an adult is an adult you can sure right but kids no i mean little kids are learning how to read you cannot have the same kind of storyline you cannot have the same kind of vocabulary you can't have the same kind of like cast content right so it's really important if you are someone who's looking to write for children to start researching and understand what are the vocabulary limits what's the sentence structure like are you writing for kids who can read at grade are you writing for kids who are striving readers um and to respect it to respect the developmental levels because you know, and, and and that's one of the reasons I think a lot of writers end up getting those rejection slips. It's because they're like, well, this is this is a book for kids. But, you know, how you write a story for a seven-year-old is not the same way you're going to write a story for a nine-year-old. And you need to understand that there is a huge difference in those things in terms of word counts and all those kinds of things. So it's really important to do your research. 
Well, I'm glad that you brought all of that to the table because Natasha, I think a lot of people need to understand this because a lot of people, well, I'm going to write a children's book. There are so many guidelines that you need to look at, you know, mm -hmm. and writing for adults, it's completely different as well. And sometimes yeah. even they have guidelines that they want you to follow. Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. Listen, if you're writing for adults and you're like, I'm going to write a mystery. Well, wonderful. Are you writing a cozy mystery? Are you writing a procedural mystery? Like there's different guidelines for the different kinds of mysteries you're going to write. And it's really important to remember that, you know, when we're looking at writing for adults, we can write in a certain way because adults are readers, right? That adult is a reader already. The reason that adult is a reader is because way back when, when they were a child, there was an author who stepped in, met them at the level they were at in terms of their maturity, their um, reading ability, their literacy comprehension. That author met them at their level and ignited a life, a love of reading that became a lifelong love of reading. And so if you wanna be a writer, like I don't care if you're writing for kids, teens or adults, the number one rule is you respect your audience. You know who your audience is and you write for them. Um, and that means that you're not gonna have big giant descriptions when you're writing for a seven-year-old because they're never gonna sit through for that. Save that for the, the older middle grade and for the YA readers, they will sit through for that. But the littles, no man, give them the action, give them the characters, give them the conflict and then let them play in that playground. So for the viewers and listeners that are watching right now and that will watch later, Natasha, where can they find mm -hmm. these guidelines for writing? Oh, uh, you can Google, right? Uh, but also, um, I would I would strongly encourage people to take classes and to find, like go into the library, get those books on craft, right? Writing for kids, writing for teens, writing for adults, all, all of those good things. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can go to conferences that are going to have workshops. Um, you can sign up for classes. Like every university has some kind of like school of continuing studies and they will have courses on that. Right. So I, for example, I teach at the university of Toronto. I teach the introduction to children's writing. So within that, we're going to hit that up. Um, but there's also, you know, there's Canscape, which is a Canadian organization. They have the packaging your imagination conference. So they're going to have lots of different workshops right what does it mean to write a picture book what does it mean to write middle grade what it what does it mean to write like if you're an illustrator and a writer what kinds of things do you need to, in terms of like creating the visual content um so you know google you can google guidelines um i would also say read a lot you cannot write for any audience if you're not reading the books for that audience right so whether you're writing for kids or adults like go to the library, go to your bookstore, get those books and start reading and start seeing, you know, what are they doing? And I would encourage you, especially with Kidlet, um, look at books that have been published within the last five years. The last five years is going to tell you where the market is, where publishing is, what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable. I mean, I love Beverly Cleary, but she's not a great reference for what we're writing now. Um, so that's really important to to stay current on those kinds of things. So um, the Google, <laughs> the the libraries, the books on craft, workshops, conferences, um, and reading a lot. Yeah, I really I really enjoying this tea time tonight, Natasha, because you're giving a lot of information, and this is what tea time is for. It's to educate, it's to teach, it's mm -hmm. to bring the awareness. Because a lot of people they just say, oh, I want to write a book, but they don't understand that there's so many steps to writing a book. You know, yes, we all can yeah. just say, I'm going to write a book. But if you really want to make an impactful book and you really want to make a difference with your stories, really do the research, really take the time. Mm -hmm. Pamper it like yeah. it's your child, like take care of it like a baby. I know yeah. what with my stuff, I'm like, uh, no, that's my baby. I'm no, I'm not giving you my story just because you want my story. <laughs> yeah. This is my story. This is my baby. Like, you know, yeah. and we have to be able to say that. And it's not because we don't value other writers or other books or collections. It's just that it's not the right time, not the right place. And it's like mm -hmm. you said earlier during the show is submitting too soon. Yeah. Well, and it's really important to understand what it means to be a writer. Uh, a lot of us grow up in, in with Hollywood imagery, right? The, the person sitting with this beautiful scenery in front of them and they're 
in a lovely warm, you know, cardigan with, you know, vegan leather elbow patches and it's, you know, they've got their cup of tea and their coffee and it's it's very romantic. It's a very romantic idea. But let's let's talk about kind of like the sciencey part of what it means to be a writer. And so, you know, our brains, um, and I would encourage, so I encourage you to go out and like, look at the research on this. So our brains understand imagination, but we don't quite understand. It doesn't quite understand imagination, right? So in other words, our brain, if we do it right, our brain imagines, uses imagination as reality. That's why we can get sucked into books and miss our bus stop. That's why when we watch scary movies and we're like, oh, that, it's, it's just a story. And then we're still sleeping with the lights on, right? Because someone out there has done enough work for our brain to go, well, yeah, but it feels real, right? So once we understand that, then you understand how difficult it is to write a story because you've got to do it in a way that that person's brain gets captured by the words you're putting on the page and believes these characters and stories to be real. The other reason you want to know this is because when you're writing that story, um, when you're in those initial drafts, uh, you are telling yourself the story. And you can tell yourself right in your brain and it's going to take you five minutes and you're going to love it because you can feel every part of it. But translating that from your brain to the page, it's going to take time and it's going to take effort and it's going to take patience. And the other thing to think of is so what happens is a lot of times people go from page one to page the end. They go, okay, great, it's done. And it's like, no, it's not because this is you telling yourself the story. And there's a difference between you telling yourself the story and you telling somebody else the story. And so writers, uh, we have a term we call draft zero. And draft zero means that is the manuscript where we're like, okay, this is now in a, in a workable form where I can now go from draft zero and do revisions to get to the point where this is now submittable, right? And it may be like draft zero, draft one, two, three, four, five, and then we get there, maybe it's to draft 10. What people don't realize is before draft zero, there can be like 14 or 15 different versions of this story before we even get to the draft zero. So there's a lot of stuff that comes before it. And then a lot of stuff that goes after it. So that's why um, you hear me saying, you've got to be patient. You've got to take your time. You've got to take the care and attention because there is somebody who is going to, of all the books in the world, pick up your book and spend time with your book. And you want to be, at least for me, so let me speak for myself. I want to be worthy of someone having chosen my book. I want that book to be in a in a place where they're like yep this was good i'm glad i chose this book and that takes time and care well it's like that story that you wrote right it, it really impacted that child's life and mm. wasn't connecting with any other books but this book was i want more yeah yeah exactly right it it reached that person when they just needed it and that's yeah. what stories are all about well, and like you said, that story was a, well, the issue they had was the marketing of it. And you're like, you know what? Yeah. I, I feel in my heart that this story needs to be out there. And had you yeah. not done what you did, that child would have never had that story. No, no, they wouldn't. And and hilariously, career wise, the book that I self published actually stood me in really good stead because I understood what it meant to have to take a book from like manuscript all the way to published. So when I work with um, editors and other publishing houses, I have an understanding of what the timelines are and how important it is to meet those deadlines. And I think they appreciate that. So, and, and by the way, whatever those friends had said, for any of you who are out there thinking, okay, but if I self-publish, will that put me in bad stead? No, it won't. Editors and agents, um, it's, it's not gonna matter to them whether you self-publish before you now approach them with a new manuscript that you would like to have traditionally published. Well, thank you so much for the information. I really, truly appreciate it. And I'm sure the listeners and viewers out there that are watching and will watch later, they will appreciate this information because I feel that the information is not out there, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are not researching. They're just saying, oh, well, I know how to do it. I know how to do it. But then if they actually research and they're like, oh, I don't know how to do it, you know? So well, yeah, and I think- researching. Oh. Yes, and I and, and I apologize for interrupting because I was gonna say no, you're you're absolutely right because 
um, a lot of times, especially adults writing for kids, we fall into the same trap. Well, my kids really like my stories, you right? My students really like my stories. Well, and that, that's great. That's great as a starting point. But we have to remember that when people care for us, by default, they're primed to like what we do, right? So they're, they're just happy and proud of us for having done it, right? And listen, if your story is specifically for your children, it's specifically for the students in your class, that's a totally different animal, right? Then yeah, absolutely. But if you're looking to reach a wider audience, then it's exactly what you're saying, Ms. Liz. We gotta do our research. We gotta do our homework. We have to start learning and relearning because how we learn to write in school is not the, necessarily how we learn how to write for a publishing, um, for a publishing career. So it's, it's going back to school again and doing the homework. But luckily we can do it on our own time and uh and there's and even luckily luckier um there's loads and loads of books out there that can help us so out of all of your books i know mm -hmm. this is a hard question for a lot of writers to answer out of all of the books that you've written natasha what is your favorite mm -hmm. i don't have one and uh i like I will, that answer I and, I, I and i'll tell you why i like that answer because yeah. it shows that each book has its own special meaning to you and that not one outshines the other. Yeah, and I, um, so I I mix up letters, I mix up numbers. Um, I'm just now becoming comfortable saying I'm dyslexic uh, because it was not something that I got a diagnosis of until like well into adulthood and talking to teachers. It was a it was a wild offshoot of doing school visits. It's having a teacher come up to me afterwards after I'd done my presentation, and you know we're talking, and then um, that teacher saying to me, "Did no one ever tell you that you're dyslexic? Based on everything you've said, based on the fact that I work with these kids, did no one tell you this?" Uh, and then suddenly a whole bunch of things, you know, were making a lot a lot of sense. So writing for me is not easy. Um, I don't have the patience for it, hilariously. So what I do is I do those 15 minutes and I take a break and I do another 15 minutes and I take a longer break. For every 15 minutes, I take a longer and longer break. So five minute break, 10 minute break, half an hour break for lunch, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, and then I come back to the page. So the reason that every book is my favorite is because at some point in time with every single one of these books, I've had to face that horrible fear that every writer faces, which is like, I'm not going to finish this book or this book is not going to be good or this is a book that's going to end me or I'm never going to solve this problem. So for different books, there's different problems. And, and my writer friends, I mean, we know this, right? Some books, we know the character, we just can't get the world. We know the plot, but we just can't figure out the character, right? So at any point in time, we're being asked to face ourselves, face our fears, face those writing blocks that we deal with. Um, and that's why, you know, and, and again, too, like the books I wrote early in my career, um, would not necessarily be the same kind of books I write now because I'm learning and I'm growing. So I'm always proud of my work. I'm always proud of, of every single one of those books that's out there. Well, thank you so much for sharing. It really is an incredible tea time tonight because we're learning a lot of educational stuff that we need to be aware of. So I want to thank you, Natasha, for doing that tonight and sharing mm -hmm. and sharing your the message that you have to impact the world with one story at a time that makes a difference. I love it. I love when people mm -hmm. say one person, one story, one tea, mm -hmm. because it takes one step to make a difference. If you're not mm -hmm. taking that step, it doesn't matter if it's a big step, small step, you've got to take that one step in life. So yeah. I want to thank you, Natasha, for sharing your, your incredible work that you're doing, the incredible stories that you have mm -hmm. out there. And for anybody who would like to reach you, Natasha, again, reach out to her through her website and look at all the incredible things that this woman is doing and out there. So any final words you'd like to say before we wrap up your tea time? No, just thank you so much for hosting me, Miss Liz. To all of the viewers and the listeners, thank you for spending this time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so Go forth, my friends. Go forth and, and conquer the world with your stories. And thank you again. Well, it was an honor and a pleasure to have you tonight, Natasha. And I hope that you can join us for the reunion show that is going to be happening in December. So I will be bringing back some of the guests from season one, season two, and season three. So they can meet each other and they can collaborate and connect, network, make some friends. 
because that's what tea time is all about. It is about joining one of us teas one at, at a time. So now we're going to jump into, before we wrap up this tea time, coming in December 1st, I have a double whammy again. That is the last double of 2022. That's right, 2022. And I have Tara Lynn Towns coming in, and she's going to be speaking about the bu Bullying Buddy app. So she has created an app for bullying and awareness. And then I have the incredible Deanne Floyd Boyne coming in, and she'll be talking about humanitarian work. So we have incredible guests lined up for December as well. So be sure to tune into those. So we have Tara in the morning, and then we have Deanne in the evening. And then we're jumping into legacy awareness on the on the 8th. And then on the 15th, we have our last show with Freddy Cruz. And then it's reunion time. So I'll get to see all of my little tea time babies because that's what you are to me, my babies. So again, Natasha, thank you for joining me on Tea Time. And thank you to the viewers and listeners that do tune in. I appreciate your support. I want to give a special shout out to all of the supporters of Tea Time. Uh, Mickey Mickelson from Creative Edge. Check out his, his work. He is an incredible man. And he is the one who brought Natasha to my table tonight. So I want to thank you, Mickey, for that. And I want to thank Patrick Williams Wayne, who is also one of Mrs. Liz's supporters. And he's out there. So check him out as well. He's bringing awareness to seniors who have vision issues. So he's bringing into larger print in that. So check him out as well. He's on LinkedIn and all of that good stuff in Facebook. So before we wrap up your tea time, we have a couple minutes left because I like to always do them for one hour. I like to give my guests a whole hour. So <laughs> Natasha, yeah. what three books would you recommend for Christmas? Oh, I have no recommendations because there's no three books that would fit everybody. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. I feel like, uh, no, Miss Liz, that's a really hard question. I would have to know who's asking. And what do they want? Do they want to laugh? Do they want to be... Um, challenged? Do they want to be creeped out? I mean, I know Christmas is all like, you know, snowfall and Christmas trees and, and you know, all those kinds of like lovely, the menorah, the, you know, the holiday stuff. But maybe some people really love like Nightmare Before Christmas. They want something with a slightly darker edge as they drink their hot chocolate. So, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Uh, why, but I will say, well, oh, I was going to say, my paddle book. Um, hmm. Well, I just started reading Lisa Gardner. So if you like thrillers and um, dark mysteries, I suppose, uh, she's she's really good. And then kid stuff. Who did I just read? Um, I can't say because the book's not out yet. But I will. Uh, it's a good book. Coming, coming soon. <laughs> I know. It's like, uh, it hasn't been announced. So... Um, but I will say, take a look at uh, some publishers like um, Running Kids Press um, or um, Orca Books. They've got some really, really great stuff for, for kids. And especially if you have a kid in your life who is a striving reader, um, definitely I recommend Orca Books because they've got tons and tons of books that will absolutely love and meet your young reader at their literacy level but we'll also meet them at their heart level. So these are like, uh, I always think of like Sean, I think it's Sean Rodman's uh, Night Terrors, right? And it's this like amazingly spooky, you know, book where he's he's at a camp and he's, he's seeing ghosts or is there something else going on? And it's, it's amazing. And it's absolutely written at a level that a teen reader reading at an elementary level will be able to embrace, so. So yeah, I guess I guess that's 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 the recommendation. Night Terrors by Sean Rodman and Lisa Gardner. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. And if anybody would like again to grab Natasha's book, be sure to check out Natasha's book. She has 30 to 40 books out there that she says <laughs> they're all on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. Check out all those goodie places, check out Walmart and grab a book. Let's start reading for Christmas this year. Let's do a bedtime story and let's bring in Christmas with some education so thanks again natasha and i will see everyone on december 1st in the morning with tara lynn towns and then deanne floyd Boynes will be joining me on december 1st so check out those tea times 
and we will be making a difference one cup of tea at a time. Thank you all and have a good night.